My name is Ben Gates and I've been the director of Greater Fort Wayne Campus Ministry now for 18 years. This is the uh, campus ministry program for both uh, Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne and the Indiana Institute of Technology. We do lots of different things with our students during the course of the year, but one of the, I think, the best uh, aspects of our ministry program um, is mission trips that we take uh, students uh, all over the world. We've been to three different continents and 11 different countries in those 18 years, just finished our 22nd trip uh, to Northern Ireland a few weeks ago. But one of the places that we love to visit is Bulgaria. And uh, I'm very fortunate today to have with me uh, the man, uh, he and his wife, who host our teams when we go to Bulgaria. And I'm thrilled to be able to uh, introduce him to you and, and to introduce his ministry to you. I think it's, it's something that is not only worth knowing, but will be very, very inspiring to you as well. So I have with me today Dinko Zlatarov. Dinko is the head overseer of the Church of God in Bulgaria. Uh, he's a church planter, church pioneer. Um, he leads a ministry called Care for All Ministries in Bulgaria. And uh, I'm just gonna ask him some questions and give you a chance to get to know him the way that we have. And as I said, I think you'll, you'll be thrilled to hear what he has to share with us. So Dinko, I, I, maybe we can start with um, what it was like growing up as a Christian in Bulgaria during the time when the Soviet Union uh, controlled Bulgaria, one of the Eastern Bloc countries, and, and how, you, uh, how you came to be a minister of the gospel in, in that particular context. Well, first of all, um, thank you, Ben, for inviting me and for uh, giving me this opportunity to share. Um, I grew up in a, in a setting that is totally different from the setting my country is in today. Uh, we grew up in a, a communist regime, a time where uh, they tried to uh, control the way we think, control the way we behaved. Everybody were uh, uh, supposed to uh, be unified in uh, just about every area of their lives, including what do we believe. Um, uh, we were not allowed to believe in God. We were not allowed to express our beliefs, um, our religions. And this is why the police was uh, persecuting the church. Uh, and I grew up in an environment in which we couldn't have um, normal free services, church services. So I remember a church that meets at night, that meets in uh, places um, uh, that um, we thought the police will not suspect. Uh, uh, we're having services usually very, very late at night, sometimes after uh, 12, 1 o'clock. Um, many times the church would meet in um, basements, in ceilings, undercover. And um, also one of the places we used to meet uh, were the ghettos, the Roma or the Gypsy ghettos, just at the outskirts of towns and villages. <clears throat> that's where, where they were settled, that's where they lived. And we went to meet there because <clears throat> we thought that the police would never suspect that we will mingle with the Roma people, with the Gypsy people, because even up to this date, there is uh, very little um, interaction between both groups in Bulgaria. And um, during that time, um, we would meet and we would worship very quietly, very secretively. We would even uh, set up our um, meetings in such a secretive way that uh, we would use code names and, and code meanings on the phone. Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to uh, make the police um, all confused about what are we trying to accomplish. Uh, and yet, many, many times they would uh, still find us, they would um, find the places where we meet and they would be 
uh, interrupting us and violently take our Bibles and they would either uh, imprison or exile our leaders, church leaders, and threaten and beat uh, a lot of the lay people in the mm -hmm. church. And uh, those are the times that I remember I grew up as a Christian. My own father um, had the secret place under the house that he built himself uh, in order to protect the Bible and the songbook. Uh, and um, we didn't know where it is, me and my brother, my mother, uh, except that we as little boys one day found it. Uh, we didn't tell anybody mm -hmm. that we did. Uh, but after communism um, was crushed, we asked our dad, why didn't he tell us? Why wasn't my mother notified? And he said, well, I just wanted to make sure that if the police would uh, imprison us and torture us all, that you will not let them <laughs> know where the Bible is. And uh, <laughs> those, are the, those were the times um, the church that I remember uh -huh. uh, was um, having services. And uh, for us as little boys, it was both very uh, dangerous but very exciting at, at the same time. Right. You said, I, I've heard you say that it was, had a James Bond feel to it. It was a very, Absolutely. very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Um, you would see some of these movies um, and we felt like it's, you know, leaving very secretively. So many times when we leave the house, then we would um, make a long um, detour. We would go through a certain streets and neighborhoods uh, trying to find out whether somebody is behind us, whether somebody is ratting us out. So and usually, um, you know, if it would take about five to ten minutes to get to the place of meeting. Uh, we will walk for an hour before we get there, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that there's nobody behind mm -hmm. our tail. Now, I know I've heard you say, um, you mentioned that you hid your Bibles, among other things, and I know the Bible was very, very special mm -hmm. and valuable because they were so scarce. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that and, and mm -hmm. tell, tell everyone the story about the time that you actually... Uh, help to smuggle some Bibles to, to your church? <clears throat> Unlike today, when um, having a Bible is um, pretty popular, and uh, during the time of communism, having the Bible was uh, a privilege that not everybody had. Uh, no one really knew when he was going to have a Bible or whether somebody's going to have a Bible. Uh, so when a Christian would be given a Bible, and usually it was uh, a very secretive way of how Bibles were distributed uh, for the sake of keeping uh, the missionaries uh, in safety. My, for example, my dad, the way that he got his Bible was that one morning he went outside the house into the garden. He found this carefully wrapped up um, uh, in plastic bag. Bible under one of his bushes. Obviously, one of the missionaries at night have been instructed in which house, and they came, they laid it under the bush. Why? Because if the police would catch my dad and torture him, that he would not be able to say so-and-so gave him the Bible. Mm -hmm. And because Bibles were such a rarity, uh, the local church instructed me when I was 16 to go to the capital uh, to meet with an American missionary and to acquire a bag of Bibles, few Bibles, few songbooks, and several tapes with music, Christian worship music. Um, and because I was just um, not growing very much physically, <laughs> I was um, uh, I was not considered um, a target that the police will suspect doing something so dangerous. I went to the capital by train. Uh, and we met for a few seconds. We didn't have the chance and we were not supposed to speak. Uh, this missionary handed me this bag of Bibles. I went back to the train. And uh, of course, at that time, I was already overly excited. And um, uh, I was under this adrenaline experience and I could feel just my veins. Mm -hmm. 
uh, how the blood was moving uh, through my system. And when I got into the um, empty train compartment, I closed the doors and I thought it went successful. And then a few moments later, six policemen walked in. And um, the chief policeman looked me in the face and he said, you thought that nobody was following you, but we were uh, ever since the moment you left your hometown. And um, after he took the bag of Bibles, he poured it down on the seat and he said, do you know that you have placed yourself in such a dangerous situation? Do you know that what we will do to you and your parents, your relatives, do you know that that will strip you off from any uh, future, from educational mm -hmm. um, and work uh, possibilities? Um, and he just started threatening me. And in that moment, as I was sitting on that um, uh, train seat, um, something God started to move inside of me and he filled me up with this boldness, with this power. And I got up, I went straight into the face of the policeman and I said, well, Mr. Policeman, <laughs> I smiled as much as I could and I said, I don't know what you can do and what your fellow policeman can do to me, but let me tell you what the God of this Bible can and will do to you to protect me because this God protected his nation, Israel, and a lot of people died because they tried to stop them. Well, I let me tell you what the Lord, and as I was just telling him how powerful God is, something must have happened because these policemen all of a sudden just were so scared. They dropped everything they had, they opened the doors, and they began running down that train aisle, and they left me, they left me with the Bibles. They didn't take the Bibles. They didn't arrest me. They never came back. And uh, that was a day of redemption. The Lord intervened <laughs> in some way that I, I really don't know what happened. Yeah. Um, but um, of course now um, we have been almost 20, 25 years um, free from communism and the situation in Bulgaria is, is a little bit more different than uh, it used to be. Yeah. I, I like, um, I'll tell the, the viewers, I like to think that there was a, an army of angels behind Dinko mm -hmm. and, and the policemen became exceedingly frightened when they, when they saw, saw those angels. But you, um, by the way, um, if you're watching the interview, you'll notice that there are pictures uh, playing behind us of, of the teams of students that we've taken to Bulgaria in 2011 and 2013. We actually, the Lord sort of, orchestrated by happenstance our meeting Dinko the first time when we were in uh, Sofia, but we quickly became acquainted with the fact that he has a unique ministry in Eastern Europe because he has real compassion for a group of people that Americans, I find, have heard of, but they have a lot of misunderstandings surrounding these people, and, mm -hmm. and these are the Roma people. We call them gypsies in this country. They go by different names in, in different parts of the world. It's the largest ethnic minority uh, in Eastern Europe. And uh, Dinko, uh, you mentioned that you used to hide in Roma homes because uh, the police would never suspect that Bulgarian nationals would want anything to do with these people. So. Maybe you could ex explain to an American audience um, who these people are and, and, the, and the unique problems that they face in Bulgaria. There is uh, quite a bit of misconception about uh, the Roma people or the Gypsy people, and we use both names in uh, Bulgaria, but it's politically correct uh, to call them Roma. Uh, that's the formal way. Uh, and that misconception uh, is lurking both here in America, Europe, and uh, our own Eastern European countries. And a lot of this has to do with uh, um, the way politics are handled. Um, and um, the problem with uh, the Roma uh, people is that they are some of the poorest, um, most uneducated people. Um, living in Europe nowadays and um, because they are in the circumstances, because of their status and because of their needs, 
a lot of people look at them as a group of criminals, people that are only um, trying to get by by um, by stealing and by doing um, uh, great business. Um, in reality, um, the Roma people are some of the sweetest people and um, uh, only people that have gone through the borders to go into their midst and to get to know them finds out that they are just as human beings, as sweet, as intelligent, as genuine um, as any other human being is. Uh, I was fortunate enough that my parents, um, as I was growing up, um, being Christian, they would take me to their homes and um, I was raised without any fear toward them, without any bias toward them. Um, and um, um, then later on, in, um, um, after the fall of communism, we came to the States to study in a Bible college. After we graduated our master's, uh, we went back and we had no idea what, what the Lord wanted from us. We had no idea that the Lord was sending us to minister to these people. Uh, the problems these people had <clears throat> and continue to have is due to um, a combination of factors. Uh, one, of one, one of them was uh, during mm, World War I and World War II, these people were severely persecuted um, by the Germans. Um, almost 6.5 million Roma or Gypsy people were put into the gas cameras. And um, during communism, they continued to be persecuted. Um, during that time, they were segregated in areas outside of um, general communities, put in uh, some places, um, concrete walled communities. So the rest of the population, the, the rest of the uh, community would not even see that they are there. And during um, all these years, these people didn't have adequate education, they didn't have the same equal opportunities to work and to mingle with the rest of society. And this is why after the fall of communism, after the Berlin Wall was crushed down, a lot of these gated concrete gypsy communities uh, were also opened up to the rest of the world. But these people were uh, you know, at least a hundred years behind everybody else. Mm -hmm. So they did not have the same equal chance to integrate into Europe and, and to uh, tap into the resources and they didn't have the same working and, and educational um, possibilities. And this is why today these people continue to live the simplest and uh, most difficult life. They, are ex they live in extreme hunger. Uh, once you go into their communities, you'll see that a lot of houses are without running water. Uh, although we live um, in Europe and Bulgaria is mm -hmm. one of the um, European uh, Union countries, uh, you will find out that the Roma people are living like in one of the most abandoned African um, or Asian countries. Uh, people are uh, just without any proper medication, children are living without shoes and clothes. Uh, most of the Roma families have a lot of children uh, and that's a misconception. Uh, the reason they have so many children is because they think and they know that by the time um, they grow up, a lot of these children will die. Mm -hmm. Some of them will disappear because of human trafficking and they want to make sure that uh, somebody will uh, be left and continue on the legacy of the family. Right. What, you mentioned human trafficking. Let me just ask you, uh, explain to the viewers why uh, the Roma children are such targets for human trafficking and how they're used. Uh, unfortunately, it's a combination of, uh, of, there's a combination of factors. One of them is that um, nobody in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian government and the Bulgarian police really uh, is caring for um, 
the Roma community. And when something happens to a white Bulgarian, you know, uh, the attitude, the general attitude is totally different. Um, and there is a lot of institutions that will work together towards mm -hmm. solving um, a problem. Whereas if it's a Roma child that disappears, then most probably nobody will even search for him. And uh, what happens is um, there is such a big market on the West um, that uh, there's um, both external and internal criminal groups that are constantly working toward exporting human beings, little children, little boys, usually trafficked out for organs, and little girls are trafficked uh, out for prostitution right. and sex slaves. And um, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, Bulgaria is one of the top um, uh, countries in the top list uh, countries uh, where human uh, trafficking is registered. Um, and um, there is very little that the Roma community can do to protect themselves against such mm -hmm. crimes. And one of the reasons is that many times the parents are also involved in it. You know, the parents living in, in complete um, uh, loss of hope, they don't know how to feed the rest of the children, so they come to a point to sacrifice one or two mm -hmm. of them for some money mm -hmm. to be able to feed the others. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, that is a big pro uh, yeah. problem. Along with that, uh, some of the major problems that these people meet are, of course, drugs, uh, criminal actions, um, a lot of abuse, a lot of domestic abuse, a lot of uh, uh, segregation from mm -hmm. the general society. These people are very afraid to go around the city of Sofia and anywhere else in Bulgaria because they get beat up all of the time. Mm -hmm. They get abused and um, ridiculed. Uh, the <coughs> children are afraid to, they're afraid to go to school because of that. So I'm going to let Dinko take a sip of his drink and I just want to tell people that uh, a lot of Americans, I find, don't even understand that the Rome or the Gypsy people are an ethnic group. Um, they came from India, actually, um, in the 10 hundreds or 11 hundreds, and, and Dinko mentioned they faced persecution, particularly from the Nazis in nice. World War II. In fact, um, if you know anything about uh, World War II, you know the Nazis used a particular gas called Zyklon B right. in their gas chambers. And I know from research that they actually tested that gas for the first time on 240 Roma children. So the first people to go into a gas chamber uh, during World War II were, were the Roma children. Right. So uh, maybe you could talk now about uh, Dinko's ministry is called Care for All. Um, and uh, maybe you could tell us about what you're doing in particular <coughs> to help the Roma people uh, and, and anything else that, that Care for All is, is working to do. If you remember, I mentioned we came back in um, 1998 um, to Bulgaria and we didn't know exactly what the Lord uh, was expecting us to be involved with um, and we imagined a lot of different um, ministries and activities but we never really imagined that God is preparing us for this purpose alone to go and to become a bridge between our societies between those two worlds um, and to begin a process of mutual integration between the white Bulgarian society and the dark-skinned Roma or Gypsy people. And I say it's a mutual integration because most times when we speak about integration, we envision and we perceive that this is a way of trying to help some people come into our society and adapt our lifestyle, our culture, uh, when the most successful integration is a, um, a dual integration in which both groups will mingle with each other, will adapt each other's cultures and will become familiar and will tolerate, not just tolerate, 
but really become familiar with each other and allow each other to express their own cultural differences. Um, um, this is um, what we as a ministry understood in the very beginning it will take for us to be able to even take the, the gospel, the good news to these people that before anything else we need to go there as human beings, as people that are not there to judge them, um, we're not there to um, show them that we are better off, uh, but to go there and to show them that we are fellow human beings and that we have one motivation um, and, and that motivation is to uh, be of help, of any help. And as we started to go in these communities in the early, well, at the late 90s, early 2000s, um, of course, in the beginning, we were both scared, skeptical. Um, we had a lot of people, a lot of our friends uh, to um, try to demotivate us, to go there, to tell us that these people are no good, that they are not prone to change, that uh, our mission will fail. Uh, tremendously <laughs> and uh, after we started going to these places and we met with the people we befriended them they befriended us they opened their homes for us we realized there was absolutely nothing strange or uh, anything fearful um, uh, actually our friendship was you know started so nicely and uh, as we befriended them and they befriended us, then we started talking about um, Jesus and about the Bible. And churches uh, were planted in uh, so many villages. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the examples I remember is when we got to a city uh, called Sliven and we met a gentleman by the name of Sasho, Sasho Vasilev. Um, he was just one of the drunkards on the street, uh, somebody who has been uh, taking uh, dr uh, drugs and um, his family was falling apart uh, and we talked to him about Jesus and we, we told him about the good news of the Bible and he listened and then he accepted Jesus. Next year he formed a little group of believers into his home uh, that group grew rapidly to become a church. Today, Sasho is a pastor of the largest and thriving, most thriving church in uh, not only in that city, but in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. And not only uh, the Bible has changed his life, not only Jesus changed his life, it changed the life of his family, changed the life of all of their relatives, it changed and transformed the life of the community itself. Sasho went to school. He finished his school, he finished his high school, and then he finished uh, a Bible school. So today he has a bachelor in biblical studies. He speaks English, works on computers, and he has become a role model in his um, uh, community. And everybody's looking at to him as like he's the mayor of the city. And we should point out he's been to Fort Wayne. He actually was here in, 2000, in uh, <laughs> 2012, uh -huh. that's right, along mm -hmm. with his son Angel. Uh, but um, Care for All is basically a group of people that have decided to implement um, what we preach in churches um, out in our daily lives. In services, we are so accustomed to speak about love and so accustomed to speak about we are no different than the others, but it's so very difficult to uh, implement this on the streets when the others are out there. Uh, and that has been the transformational point when you look in those that are different from you, when you look at those that are not educated, that are poor, and you look at them like they're equals, mm -hmm. and you see them as people that have same value, then um, Jesus uses this to create a bridge between you two, right. and to create a bridge between the two groups of people. And um, 
we as, as a ministry have realized a long time ago that God wants us not only to go there and preach the gospel, but to help these people in any way we can. And this is how we uh, started various uh, educational initiatives. We tried to uh, take as many of their adults and, uh, and uh, enroll them in school so they can finish their education. Just like uh, we have a fresh example in our newly uh, planted church, the Bridge 2 in the capital, we, you know, most of the people are so poor and most of the people are without any type of education. But just a few months ago, motivated by what she has seen um, is happening in the church, we started this local school where we mentor the kids and we train them in math, Bulgarian and English languages, computers. And this lady, this mother, the mother of one of uh, the children, was so inspired that she went and she enrolled herself in the school and now she is in second grade <laughs> and she's so determined to finish her schooling mm -hmm. and um, this is where the church and the christians have um, that's how they have become the most important tool the lord has in transforming the life of these people by education by training these people on basic um, hygiene habits, uh, on um, seeking their rights in, um, in the society, mm -hmm. by looking inward and seeing their value as human beings. Um, and once these people are given the chance to see how cool, how wonderful they are, mm -hmm. they have they absolutely have the same capacity. Their um, intellect is no different than ours. Mm -hmm. Their uh, emotional um, capacity is no different than ours. In the last 15 years, what we experienced is hundreds, if not thousands of individuals who realized that through Jesus, they have found their own value mm -hmm. and the meaning of life, the way the Bible presents it to us humans, mm -hmm. they have found enough courage to break through the chains of poverty, mm -hmm. to excel, to thrive, and to become absolutely equal with everybody else in the European society mm -hmm. in which we live in. And some of those examples are just, I said, just as I said, Pastor Sasha Vasilev. Pastor Tony Chinkov, he is my assistant pastor, and um, this guy is right now finishing his master's in law. He is going to be a lawyer. And then um, uh, Gospodin Kolev, or as we know, Gopi, who married a white Bulgarian lady, uh, and they have this wonderful family today, both of them finished their master degrees and they have this incredible ministry to children um, uh, that are from the same uh, uh, neighborhoods um, gypsy roma mm -hmm. misfortunate little kids and we have hundreds of examples like this mm -hmm. of how absolutely possible it is mm -hmm for those people to um, realize their potential mm -hmm. uh, with the help of Jesus and mm -hmm. with the help of you and I. And this is why, Ben, it's been such an incredible um, compliment for you guys to come to Bulgaria. Well, you know, I was gonna, I was, <laughs> I was gonna say that all of the people that um, Dinko mentioned, we've, we've met and they've become close friends. And I thought maybe you could um, talk, talk about a little bit about the importance of this international partnership or global partnership that the Lord has, has crafted between us and, and why it's so critical that our students come to Bulgaria to, uh, to partner with you in this ministry. Although now speaking in the studio, it looks so exciting, it looks so 
in inspiring to be among the Roma people and to see the change and the transformation. In day-to-day -day life, things are not so sparky. Um, as a matter of fact, even today, most of our society and most of our churches um, don't want to do anything with the Roma people. There is still such a hatred, such a misunderstanding, such a segregation. Um, and um, we don't almost, I mean, we don't always get any, any help or, or any support um, or any volunteers to come and help us uh, doing what we're doing from Bulgaria. As a matter of fact, not even Europe. Uh, the only people that come and help us, that um, come and give us a hand and support it financially are people from the United States, uh, such as yourself. A few years ago, the Lord brought you to Bulgaria with a group of uh, young students and uh, what you guys are instrumental in is that you come there and you don't have one problem embracing the Roma people. And what is so amazing is that you walk into these neighborhoods and you are white-skinned Americans who come into the very midst of where these people live. And they have not seen other like you. None from the Bulgarian society would ever welcome their streets or come into their homes or eat with them. And for them, this is the most amazing experience. Mm -hmm. You are such a motivation and, and help not only to the church, but the community itself, because now they see that Christ, that the church has absolutely no problem with differences. Actually, it's the church that places together under one roof and, and makes us one body mm -hmm. and we worship together disregarding the fact that you speak English and we speak mm -hmm. Bulgarian, they speak Roma, we all unite in one under the flag of Jesus. And you come there and you play with their kids and you, um, you serve them food, you bring loads and loads of food. It's face, just face paint like you see face paint, cotton candy absolutely and skits on the streets it's just transformational for them it really touches their heart mm -hmm. when you come over there they feel so honored they feel so blessed that somebody will even come and shake their hand and hug their neck in this way you you implement the idea that they are fellow human beings just as we are. Mm -hmm. And um, once you go in, then general society looks at the church in a totally different way. Now, all of a sudden, those Roma people that have been meeting in, in, in that little house or in that abandoned building, you know, a lot of these churches are just so poor. Um, well, yeah, sometimes Brother Dinko or other Bulgarians come along. But now this large group of Americans come as a delegation among their midst. And that group of Americans are coming not to be among the streets of Sofia. They don't come you know, to, just to take pictures around, but they come to have a church service with these Roma people. That changes the whole view of the church. It changes the climate. It, it, it melts the heart even of the very Bulgarians and makes a lot of Bulgarian Christians also a little bit aware that that is something that they should do mm -hmm. more often. And I always, tell, um, I always tell the students that it's important for us um, to be able to, to know and to, to, to uh, fully comprehend that the body of Christ is global. Uh, and, you know, we took a team to Northern Ireland last week. We take teams to India and Bulgaria. And we find brothers and sisters in Christ where we go, we just worship a little bit differently. But uh, I've seen, I, uh, I think we've been in each other's presence maybe four times physically. That's right. But um, there's a real kinship mm -hmm. uh, and friendship that 
that we don't just enjoy, but the students enjoy too, and, and uh, it's, it's just a tremendous blessing for us. I know we visited an orphanage too, mm -hmm. and I know you, you minister in the orphanages in uh, Bulgaria. Why don't you, can you explain mm -hmm. briefly what, <clears throat> what the particular problems that Roma children in these institutions and orphanages face in Bulgaria? Because of the hunger, because of the unemployment, a lot of Roma families um, need to leave the country and seek job opportunities in Europe. And a lot of them end up in bad areas. Um, a lot of them end up on the street begging, others prostituting. Um, and um, unfortunately, a lot of parents abandon their children in Bulgaria. Most cases, they would leave them with relatives who after a few months uh, cannot take care of them anymore, so they release them on the street. And finally, these kids end up in um, uh, governmental institutions, orphanages, uh, and uh, there they have a shelter, they have food. Um, the government tries to provide for them as much mm -hmm. as they can. But for the 20 years, 20, uh, last 20 years, uh, CAREFOR has uh, been uh, trying to help to work in hand in hand with those institutions to provide these kids with anything they need. Um, and uh, we've been providing humanitarian aids such as clothing, shoes, food, um, school accessories, school supplies. But one of the most important areas in which we felt the Lord wanted us to be involved in their lives was um, providing them with medical attention. A lot of these children have problems. Some of them have been born with internal and external uh, physical problems, deformities mm -hmm. and illnesses that some of them actually very easy to correct, but um, uh, the institutions wouldn't have the money right. uh, to uh, cover them. So we have gone to hospitals, we would profile those kids and advertise them to hospitals, doctors, some mm -hmm. organizations and beg on their behalf um, and we call this create a smile ministry because a lot of the children have um, um, problem with their mouths they have um, what do you call them palates Cle cleft, cleft palates pal cleft palates and um, um, and this is how the idea of create a smile was born once we take a kid to a doctor and uh, we tell him about him and he looks at the profile, initially most of them would turn us down, but we would be more persistent and we would explain to them that there is nobody else who would uh, do this to this kid and uh, after some time they would agree and we have to pay some fees, sometimes they cover everything. Mm -hmm. um, but once they operate and this kid smiles for the first time and is man, uh, manages to eat for the first time himself, herself, and um, um, just erupts this smile on their face, right. that changes and melts the heart of the doctors. Um, and one after another, we have been able to take hundreds of kids to the hospitals so they would receive the needed treatments mm -hmm. um, a lot of these children today, they are in their 20s, uh, and um, a lot of them are in churches, and they are ministering to others. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, very exciting to be able to um, minister to those that are abandoned, that are without mm -hmm. parents, that are living in those orphanages. But what we are doing today, some of our most recent efforts, is to be of help to orphans with parents. These are the people that we minister to in Sofia. This is why the bridge too was created. When we got there, we realized the streets are full with orphans who have both parents at home. And I call them orphans because although they have parents, they don't have food. Right. Although they have parents, they don't have clothing. Although they have parents, they don't have any opportunities to go to school and they are absolutely doomed to grow up as criminals, to um, repeat the same model. And this is why then a lot of children end up marrying at 10, mm -hmm. 11, 
12. A lot of little girls you'll see they're being pregnant. And then the cycle begins again. It's a vicious cycle. Uh -huh. And at, at 10, most girls would come to church and share with me, I cannot bear it anymore because I'm treated as an adult at home. I have more responsibilities toward my little uh, siblings than my mom. And uh, my mom is gone. She's working somewhere. I don't know where. So I'm the mom now at, at home. And so very many times fathers would physically, sexually abuse their mm. children. And uh, that's why I call them orphans. Yeah. And the church has been instrumental in helping these kids out. We began this church with only one child, two elderly women. And for several months, we met at the church praying and singing. And then slowly that girl by the name of Tsveta or Flower, she started inviting some of her um, little friends. Mm -hmm. And then she introduced us to her brothers. She lives in a family with four other siblings and her mom and dad all living in a small area in mm -hmm. the size of the studio without um, uh, anything under their feet. It's just ground and without a uh, restroom or bathroom, no running water, no electricity. Um, but slowly the church got filled up with children. The children were the first that uh, filled up the church space. Mm -hmm. And I realized very soon that these kids, most of everything else, of course they needed food, they needed medicine, they needed a lot of stuff, you know, clothing and shoes, which we provided. But the number, need number one was education. Right. And we started the school there at the church and because of that school, because of the love of the children toward Jesus and toward schooling, their parents showed interest. They started coming to our services, and today I can report almost 99% of those families are saved, how unified. Many, uh, how many conversions in the last few months? 75. Uh -huh. We have 75 people giving their lives to Jesus, and that's yeah. not counting the children. Right. And it's so important that the children be tutored because, as we said earlier, they're frightened to go to school because they're bullied there. And so it's, it's exactly. hard to get the Roma children to actually go to a Bulgarian school. It's the comp again, it's, um, it's a syndrome of um, factors. Right. It's not just the kids are frightened, but many times they don't have shoes uh -huh. to put on to go to school. And everybody ridicules them. Uh, is the, are the school open? Yes, they are open. The government says everybody can get education. If they want, they can go. But white Bulgarian kids have money for a breakfast, lunch, um, uh, while they don't have it. Many mm -hmm. times they, they just cannot get on a bus because they don't have tickets for mm -hmm. uh, public transportation. And once they get to school, everybody ridicules them because they smell. Right. They have fleas and bugs and lice. and um, very soon they realize we don't, we are not wanted here and we don't want school. Mm -hmm. They are growing up with the idea that the school is a very hostile environment for mm -hmm. them. Hmm. Um, I know uh, when we were uh, in Bulgaria this last trip, we did visit one of the orphanages mm -hmm. that Dinko was mentioning. And you would think that perhaps there might be some adoptions coming out of those orphanages. But the problem is that in Bulgaria, <laughs> nobody wants to adopt a Roma child. Mm -hmm. And the government has a law, if I remember correctly, that there can be no international adoptions unless a Bulgarian national family attempts an adoption unless first. Unless three, three families. Three, three families. And since no one does, these children are mired in, in that institution until they turn 18 and are kicked into the streets. And guess what happens on the streets? They go there without any skills and the only thing waiting for them there are the thugs and uh, the mafia. Mm -hmm. They start selling drugs you know, in order to live. Right. Uh, and uh, a lot of them just leave the country. They are smuggled into the Western countries where they deal with prostitution or drugs. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. Yeah. 
Well, I want to I want to mention um, that um, we're going to be taking another trip to Bulgaria yeah, next year. to work with um, with Dinko and Care for All Ministries in March of 2016. And our trips are not open just to college mm -hmm. students. We'll we'll take anybody. In fact, we'll organize as many trips as necessary to get people over to Bulgaria to be able to. Uh, have these children capture their hearts the way that they've captured our hearts in the past. But beyond, um, well, including visiting, what are some of the ways that the people watching today uh, could help you and could help care for all? Well, number one, America has been number one in distributing the Bible around the world and sending missionaries, and that's why I'm here, because you guys were there first. You guys put a Bible under um, this little bush in my father's garden, and uh, because we were touched and our lives were transformed, now we are in the Roma community doing the same what was done unto us. We're sharing the good news um, of Jesus Christ, and what I believe what most Americans today can and are willing to do is continue to pray. Pray for countries like ours and pray for um, um, local ministers along with missionaries to be effective in what they do. Along, so, alongside with that, of course, many would want to join you and come to Bulgaria and see what God is doing and, and, and stretch a hand and, and hug one of these human beings and some people may not think that this is a lot, but this is really all it takes. Mm -hmm. um, alongside with that, of course, those that are uh, capable in financing, in uh, helping um, in any way our initiatives in education, in building churches, in helping those that are struggling, um, all of that is, of course, uh, incredible. So, and it will be greatly appreciated. And I want to say, too, that um, if uh, someone would like to uh, either join us on a trip to Bulgaria or uh, donate uh, to the support of Dinko uh, Zlatarov and Care for All Ministries, all you have to do is contact us at Greater Fort Wayne Campus Ministry. Um, I think what we can probably do is put the information on the screen here, but uh, I'll give you the, the telephone number. It's 260-481-6992. 260-481-6992. And the email address is very simply ministry, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y, at ipfw.edu. And uh, uh, you, can, you can help or get more information um, about the ministry. Is there any last thing that, that you'd like to share that we haven't covered in well, our conversation? Well, first of all, I, I just wanted to take a few seconds to thank you and thank each and one of the students that have already been in Bulgaria that have joined you. Uh, because you guys have been such a blessing to us and to me personally, such an inspiration to see the uh, servanthood and the humbleness and the gentle, the gentle loving spirit that you guys carry out and all of that has um, inspired us uh, so much and helped us through the years. Um, also want to thank each and one of uh, the people in the whole process right here at IPFW and the campus ministry. Uh, you guys are amazing and we want to thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, bring a sense of hope to all of those who would view this um, little program and to tell you that although the church seems to be um, such a little marginalized uh, institution and we hear uh, so many negative reports about uh, the latest development of the church the church continues to be number one because jesus christ is the head he is the groom and the church is instrument number one in helping people around the world uh, it may seem sometimes it's um, that big organization or that big organization, but the church continues to be um, motivator and influencer and tool number one in helping those in need. 
And I just wanted to tell you that we are expected to bless the people with a cup of cold water as simple as that. Sometimes we feel that we don't have the uh, enough resources. We feel that we are not capable enough. We don't have uh, enough time to be involved. But it really is so simple, just as what you have done. You have come to Bulgaria. You have blessed the people with a smile, with a hug. You played with their children. And all of this is what Jesus required from us, as we read in Matthew 10, 42. If you do this unto the little ones, you have done it unto me. So I believe that each and one of us have the capacity to bless another human being with a cup of cold water. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, I just want to say that we are very proud of, of what God is doing in your ministry mm -hmm. and we love you very, very much. I'm so grateful for mm -hmm. um, the friends that God has allowed me to meet all over. I mean, if someone had told me five years ago that I would mm -hmm. be close friends with a man in Bulgaria, I would say, now where is Bulgaria? I'm not even certain where it is. So, <laughs> But uh, we're very, very grateful and we look forward to coming back and being with you again. Uh, next March. And again, if, you, if you'd if you like to join us or you'd like more information um, about um, Care for All Ministries <coughs> and Dinko's Ladder Off, all you have to do is, is contact us, Greater Fort Wayne Campus Ministry, 260-481-6992, or email us at ministry, M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y, at ipfw.edu. Thanks so much uh, for joining us for this conversation today. God bless. God bless you. Les personnages dans mes tableaux